There are some sermons where you don't have people in mind and you're just preaching something general. And then there are sermons where you do have people in mind. <laughs> right? Because there are guys in our church, not just you two, but because Anthony has um, sort of expressed a desire too. And it's, I'm not talking about any specific one of you three. Um, but these are just some thoughts I have because I think about you guys and um, I've preached on qualifications of a bishop before. But today, I just wanted to touch and um, talk about something that a lot of people don't talk about when they talk about qualifications of a bishop is the qualifications of a bishop's wife, right? And pe- a lot of people lose that emphasis because when we, when we talk about ordination and we talk about the qualifications of a bishop, a lot of the emphasis is on the man, and rightly so. Right? Because the man's the leader, the man is going to be the one that's spearheading this thing. But we don't want to lose sight that it's not a one-man show. And if you guys think that what I do here is a one-man show, uh, you guys are not giving Elizabeth the credit she deserves. Right? If you think I could do this without Elizabeth, you guys have no idea the, the amount that Elizabeth puts into allowing this to even happen. You know, like, why do I even have the time to do these things? Why can I you know, work a job and my spare time focus on preaching sermons and stuff. It's because Elizabeth is on the same page knowing that we're serving God together. So she's, she, she's not getting bitter or anything. She's, she's, she's understanding, hey, she's got a role to look after the children, support that so that we as a family are able to help you by pastoring this church. So yes, there is qualifications for a bishop and the emphasis is on the man, but... The wife of the candidate, what what do I mean by candidate? The person who's seeking ordination, the, the, the wife of that person, there are qualifications for her to meet as well. And you got to remember that the, the, your family, your wife, it's a reflection of your spiritual life because, um, you know, obviously you lead your wife and your children. So whilst you may think, okay, I'm preaching on the bishop's wife. You may think, well, I'm never going to be a bishop's wife. You know, I'm never going to be a bishop. You've got to remember that the qualifications for a bishop and a bishop's wife, they're for all Christians. Right? So don't tune out and think, hey, this doesn't apply to me. The qualifications still apply to you in the sense that's the standard we should all be striving for. Like the standard that you have to meet to be a bishop is, every, is, is what we all should be striving for. So women should be striving to be like a bishop's wife or a deacon's wife. But it's just if you meet those qualifications, then you are qualified to be a bishop. And obviously that's to the judgment of the, the bishop that's here already, me here or, or Kevin or whichever bishop that you fall under. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be just uh, not talking about just qualifications in general, but talking about um, the bishop's wife. So whilst it is more applicable to you guys in three, it's also, bring, I'm trying to bring your wife into the equation too and, <laughs> and uh, pulling her into the fire today. So remember, being a bishop's not a one-man show. We look at the qualifications in Titus 1 and we'll compare it with 1 Timothy 3 as well. It says, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife. So you can see here, as we go through the qualifications in Titus and in 1 Timothy 3, you'll notice that the family is mentioned first, right? In Titus, blameless, the husband of one wife. So there's a family, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. So now, now it, says, it says blameless, then it's his family. It says blameless again. Now it goes into his character as a steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. And I'm just breezing over these because this is not the emphasis of the sermon today. No striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Holding fast the faithful word as he is being taught that he may be able by sound doctrine to both both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So what's interesting here, and what I always emphasize to people seeking to be a bishop, is you need to understand that even in these qualifications, what is more important, what is listed first, is your family and your character, right? Whereas a lot of people just think, hey, if the doctrine, if I have the right positions, then I'm ready to to be a bishop. No, no, no. You know, it's not. It's, it's your family, it's your character first, that's what's more important. And look, it always second, it's the sound doctrine. Right? So it's not that sound doctrine is not important, it's just that it comes secondary to your character. And I'll explain why in a bit. 
First Timothy 3, we see similar, right? This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, so right, it starts with the desire of the man, right? But the woman needs to be on board too. He desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So you see here, the, the family comes first. It's always blameless, the husband of one wife. It's, it's, going, it's going back to, to, you know, being a family man. Vigilant, sober, this is the character. Good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. Run that, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So you see here the character and the family. There's nothing here yet about this guy's doctrine, right? For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now it gets into the doctrine. This is what I believe that verse 6 is talking about. Not a novice, because he's not a novice in the faith. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good rapport of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We'll just keep reading because we're going to go through. Likewise, must the deacons be grave? So the qualifications of the bishop are the same for deacons, but it's just you're going into a different office or role. You know, bishops are the overseers, deacons are the servants. Not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Now this is where I'm focusing on today, is there, there are qualifications for the wives. Now some people, they get this idea that they just think, you know, when, when I'm going to be a bishop or the example that I'm setting as a bishop, you know, I've had people tell me this before, it's, you know, that's, that's my job. You know, I'm, I, it's like people say, ah, oh, it's just my responsibility. My, my, it's my example to you. Just as long as I'm going soul winning and I'm reading my Bible and I'm faithful to church, that's fine. But my wife doesn't need to be faithful to church. My wife doesn't need to go soul winning. My wife doesn't need to know the Bible. It's just, you know, it's almost like they just think, it, they just silo the man and just think as long as the man's a good example, it doesn't matter what the wife's doing. And it's just like, no, 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 no. no. It's, if your wife's a bad example, you're a bad example too right? <laughs> it's you and your wife, it's, it's a reflection of the character. And even here in 1 Timothy 3, it's not, this is what I'm saying, it's not just qualifications for the man, because in 1 Timothy 3, there are requirements for the wife. Look at this, even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Now, obviously, it doesn't go into it as much, and that's what I'm saying. Obviously, the, the emphasis is on the man, but what I'm getting at is here, it, it's not that there's no, it's, it's not like there's just a free pass for whatever your wife is like. You know, your wife could just be dressed like a prostitute, doesn't care about church, doesn't care about the things of God, never goes soul winning, doesn't care, you know, but, but, but this man, he's on fire for God and everything like that, and we're going to ordain him and he's going to start, no, 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 <laughs> they have to both be on board. So it's like, let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, this is why I want, well, this is one point I want you to see here, is that, and before I go there, because I don't want you guys to get ahead of me. Remember I was saying that the qualifications of a bishop and a deacon, like I said, it, 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 it applies to all of us, right? So even though I'm talking about bishops and deacons and deacons' wives and bishops' wives, just remember when you're hearing these qualifications, this is something I need to strive for. For as well, even though I'm not, I'm never going to be a bishop. I don't have the desire, uh, desire the office of a bishop, or you know, I don't desire to be a bishop's wife. Even what I was saying was, in those qualifications, it's more important the character, right, than the doctrine. But a lot of people have it the other way around. Now, the reason why I believe the character is so much more important than the doctrine is because it's easy to teach somebody doctrine. But developing character and developing godliness and developing brotherly kindness and charity, that's a lot higher spiritually. See, because people think, people have this idea that they're so spiritual. And this is what babes in Christ are like. Babes in Christ, they learn the Bible. They learn doctrine just from sermons that they've heard. And we've all been there. I've been there as well. And you just think you know it all. You think you're just this spiritual juggernaut and you know you think, oh, because I know all this Bible, I know all this doctrine, I'm just going to tell people like it is and you just throw love aside. You just throw charity aside. You throw how to speak to people aside, how to present yourself aside, how to comment on social media aside. No, 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 no. The higher calling, 
the, the thing that is harder and more spiritual is the charity, is the character, because doctrine anybody can learn. Anybody can listen to hours of preaching and then just learn all the doctrine. They know all the doctrine, right? But you can't listen to hours of preaching and become a loving Christian, yeah. right? Become a loving... That takes, that takes time to develop, right? And this is what we learn in 2 Peter 1. Look at what it says here. And beside this, giving all diligence... Look at this. Add to your faith. So that's your salvation, right? First you get saved. It says, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. So you see how it's the, it's the beginning where you add to your faith some things good to do, and then you start to add to your faith some knowledge. That's where you start learning the doctrine. So this is early on in your Christian journey of how spiritual you are, is just learning what's right, what's wrong, you know, and, 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 and doctrine in the Bible. Because that's easy to do. You can come to church, you can learn doctrine. But when we move on from that, like it says, add to your knowledge temperance. Right? This is some discipline. And to temperance, patience. So now it's like discipline for a long time. You know, you patiently keep on serving the Lord, keep on doing what's right. And if you, you start reading this as, hey, I'm, I'm upgrading, right? It's like the next level. You think of it as an RPG game or something. I'm going to up level to the next, you know, now I'm Viking, I'm Valerie, and whatever. <laughs> so here it's like you're adding knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience. Look at this, godliness. So you see now why I think Learning the doctrine is not that big a deal. It's about character. Godliness. Look at this. Godliness, brotherly kindness. Right? So it's like your godly is that you, you're cutting sin out of your life. You're actually trying to live separate and holy. And then even above godliness, because that's already hard enough, right? Now it's saying add brotherly kindness to actually love your brothers and sisters in Christ, which is what I'm talking about. When people have strive and they, they bitter against each other, and all, that's, that's a really hard thing to do, to be offended by somebody, but to still love them, to, to give them the benefit of the doubt. When somebody steps on your toes or they say something against you and you say, hey, I hope this guy can, you know, can repent because I want to be able to forgive them. You know, it's like I don't have to hold this grudge. That's brother, And to brotherly kindness, charity. Charity is like the ultimate goal because charity is like completely unconditional. They don't even have to be your brother in Christ. You still love them. You know, you're still trying to be charitable. That's, that's the end goal of Christianity, right? Christianity is like, you know, char charity is, is what's left, you know, because that's, that's, what, that's, that's what we're called to do is love. <clears throat> so you see here, now you understand why when it comes to the office of a bishop, it's not just about your knowledge. You know, it's not just about, because people, people can learn a lot of things. And we're seeing this, right, in the new IFB. These guys are smart. Yeah. They know a lot. Yep. But the Bible says, you know, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, uh, I've become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Yep. Wow. Right? Because it doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how much Bible you've memorized. And I'm not saying these things, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these things are not important. Doctrine's important. Yep. I'm just saying it's not as important as charity because without charity, you're nothing. Right? And charity is a lot harder to get to, right? So when you see somebody's character, you don't judge somebody's spirituality by the amount of knowledge they have. You judge their spirituality by their character, by their family, by their brotherly kindness, by their charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Look at what it says, above all these things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. This is why this was on my mind when I was talking to you guys about those other things. You know, yeah, you know, we, we, we are a church of sinners, guys. We're not perfect. We're a church of people that, you know, we're going to say things the wrong way. You know, like I, I thought I could joke with somebody and, you know, I, you know, I joked with them and not, now it's sensitive, took it the wrong way. Now they're offended. It's just like, you know, some, sometimes, you know, it's, you, it's not like you're trying to upset people, but just sometimes you do silly things. You know, it's, I've said silly things as well. Um, just not sensitive about these things. Uh, you know, people are going to offend and upset you. But that's why the Bible here is exhorting us to say, hey, have fer not just charity, have fervent charity. You know, be passionate about loving one another. And this is what's required because this is what's going to cover the multitude of sins that happens in this body of believers here. You know, we're, going to, we're going to sin and we're going to say stupid things and we're going to rub each other the wrong way and we're going to get in the flesh. But if we strive for fervent charity, 
then we'll always be looking at how we can better ourselves, how we can do the right thing, how we can right that wrong, you know, how we can give that person the benefit of the doubt so that we don't get offended. And if everybody has that fervent charity, this is how we love one another. And, and you know, this is, this is, you know, with this whole, with churches like ours, the, the flag of our churches has always been, we believe the right doctrine. But do you see how that's, that's, not what we want, that's not what we want to strive for? We don't want people to know us just because we have the right doctrine. Because any, like I said, anybody can be taught the right doctrine. What does Jesus say? He says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Look at this. By this, what? The fact that we love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So do people know us by our doctrine? Do people know us by our marking? No, people are meant to know us by the fact that we have fervent charity one toward another, right? That's how we're meant to be known. That's, if anyone says, hey, that's what I know about the church in Punchbowl, you want to say that they know because those guys just love each other so much. You know, they, that's how we know that they're disciples of Jesus Christ. Love. You know, and I know you know, we, we're, we're like in a movement where love's like a dirty word, right? Because the liberals are just taking love and it's just like, oh, everything's love. But, but you know, you don't want to swing the other way too far as well. You know, I get God is hate. I don't have a problem with hate. God, is, God, is, God hates as well. But he, he's not all hate too. You know, it's just like he's not all love. He's not all hate. And in fact, love is, is more important than hate, right? But I guess, I guess he, he hates so much because he loves so much. I guess it's kind of, it's kind of I wouldn't say one's more important than the other. Because you hate because you love. But love, love is what should identify us, right, as disciples of Jesus Christ. So let's go back. So, you know, obviously family, um, you know, is the, is the greatest measure of a man's spirituality. So a man desires the office, you know, like we, we read here. You know, a man desires the office of a bishop. But you've got to remember, you need, you need a faithful wife to be qualified, right? Your wife has to be in it as well. You know, your wife is a measure. Like, like I said, people can't just say, oh, you know, my wife doesn't need to be an example. No, your wife does need to be an example too, right? Because it's, it's both. And it's like even when I was at Lighthouse, you know, like anyone who was at Lighthouse, like Elizabeth was going soul winning as well. You know, every week we'd do the same. We'd switch and, you know, there was a lady, you know, she hasn't been going soul winning much because there's no ladies for her to go soul winning with. <laughs> if there's a lady for her to go soul winning with, I'll make her go soul winning. So whilst, whilst there's qualifications for your wives, you know, it's up to you guys to make sure that your wives are doing these things too, remember? So it's like, I have to make sure, you know, I'm leading my wife to make sure that she does these things and trying to be a good example for her and encouraging her, you know, not giving her reasons to not go and things like that. So just like your wife is a measure, your children's a measure. Because think about this, your wife plays a big role in, in, in order for you to fulfill some of these requirements. If you think about, um, uh, like, hospitality, you know, like the Bible says a bishop must be given to hospitality. You know, and unless you're just some, some rich guy that just, you know, giving us taking people out all the time. But, you know, generally if you have people over, you know, you, you at least need your wife to take care of your kids. You know, when you have people over, your, your wife has to be willing to, 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 to help out and cook and all these sorts of things and, and be hospitable to these people. So you can see how it's not just this guy who's just on his own doing his own thing. No, no, no. He's a married man with family and it's his family that is helping him to do these things. Right? And not only that, I mean, your wife is going to play a big role in how your children turn out. Right? Like what, how your wife runs the home, how you encourage and instruct her to run the home is going to change how your children are as well. Now, the reason why I think there's, you know, it's dangerous to not emphasize the qualifications of a bishop's wife is because sometimes, just like you know, men getting married, sometimes just like getting the wife becomes an idol, Sometimes becoming the bishop of a church becomes an idol too. And, it just, and I'm not saying you guys do that. I'm not, I'm not saying any of these things because I think any, you know, or you know, I have a problem with you or anything like that. Um, these are just thoughts that I have on this topic that I think will be profitable for anybody to hear. But what sometimes happens, and, and if, if you, you guys probably know this, you know, and, and I'm, sure, I'm sure Lewis knows people that are like this you know, at, at, at other churches, Sometimes guys get a goal. They, 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 they want to be a bishop of a church so much. And it, it, it almost is unbelievable to you guys if you haven't thought of this, but they just see their wife and children as a means to get what they want. 
You know what I mean? Like they, they want to, like their goal is to, to, to be a bishop of a church one day. And, and in their mind, they just think, I just need to do the wife and the kids thing to tick yeah. that box. And then I can, and it's, that's just the, the most ungodly frame of mind to have, you know, as, as any person, to think that your wife and your children are a means to get to something that's not important as your wife as your, and your children, which is to be the bishop of a church. So <clears throat> some people see, you know, some people that have the wrong perspective on this, they see marriage as like an inconvenient necessity to get ordained, right? And that's just asking to fail miserably because what happens with people that have that mindset, and it's happened before, when they just think, I've done the wife, I've done the children things, and now they're just going to travel around the world doing what they really wanted to do, which was preach at different churches and have that sort of fame or whatever, or have that ministry. You know, I'm not saying their heart's necessarily in the wrong place, they just have the wrong priorities. So then they just leave their wife at home to, to, to raise their kids because it's like, hey, they've met the qualifications and now they go. And then what happens if the wife is not on board, if the wife you know, is not of one mind with the man doing this and there's not a good relationship, the wife becomes bitter. Right? She becomes bitter because now it's like, oh, you chose the ministry over me as opposed to thinking, hey, we're in this together to serve in this ministry. She thinks, oh, you know, I'm just, I was just used. You know, just, you just married me so that you could qualify. But you don't actually care about me. You know, things like that happen. It's just so sad. This is not what we all read in Ephesians 5. I mean, read Ephesians 5. And do you think, do you think, you know, after you read Ephesians 5, that, you know, we're meant to love, you know, our, our, our office of a bishop more than our wife? Husband, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now let's just park there for a minute. Just think about that for a bit because the Bible is telling us as husbands to love your wives in the same way Jesus Christ, think about this, how he loved the church. So Jesus Christ came from heaven, took on flesh, lived a perfect life for 33 years. He died on the cross. He went through all the shame the suffering, the agony, willingly gave up his life to save us, died, went to hell for three days and three nights, suffered an eternity of God's wrath, rose again the third day, and did all the other stuff that he did, right? The, the, the rest of the stuff was when he, after he rose victorious. And God is saying that's the sort of love that he expects from a husband on his wife. That's a huge call. You know, and, and, and why, you know, women go like, oh, you know, I've got to submit to my husband. He gets all the, takes to make all the decisions. It, well, you're, you're, you, don't have to die. you don't have to die for your wife like Christ died for the church. What do you, you, you got the easy route, ladies. You know, you, you think it's, you, you have no idea. Like, that's why, that's why the man has authority, because that's what's expected from him. Yeah. Right? Gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Look at this. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You know, do you get this picture that you just marry your wife just to, you know, now she just takes care of your kids and you just go do your thing? No, no, no. This is like, he cares about the church. He sanctifies and cleans, trying to improve the church, make the church more holy and, and grow in faith. He, that's, that's one of Christ's, um, one of his priorities. He has sought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, so let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So this idea that people have, and I'm just going back to being a bishop, of just the wife just being this, chick, this checkbox to get where you want to go is so ungodly and so against God's will. You can't read a passage like this and think God is pleased with that. That's why I have a, I have a blog online. I, don't, I haven't put anything on there yet, but I started a website, it's victortay.com. 
But you might have seen it on my Instagram as well. I, I sort of came up with this slogan for my, my personal stuff. And, and I made it, if you've seen it, it says, it says Christian, there's four words, it says Christian, husband, father, bishop. And the reason why I have it in that order is because that's my priorities. Number one, I'm a Christian. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And number two, that means I'm a loving husband, right? As, as according to Ephesians 5. Number three, my priority is, is my children. I'm a father. And guess what number four is? It's this church, right? So that's why this, this church is not my highest priority, right? It's something that I do, uh, meaning, meaning like my office as a bishop is not my highest priority. You know, obviously, like being a Christian and going to church is part of being a good father and a husband. But if, if my family started to fail, you know, this has to go. You know, I'd have to step down, right, and take care of my family. So that's, that's the priorities that it needs to be, you know. So when it comes to being a bishop, you know, you have to be of one mind. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Um, your wife, as a bishop, right, or even as a deacon, your, your wife needs to understand the task that you're going to take on you know because it's like i said it's not just you that's in this fight anymore and 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 being a bishop it's not the same as just your secular job you know like you can just go to work and just keep working and 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 your, and your job separate you, you can't do that in the ministry right because in the ministry your your life is your job you know your example is your life that you can't like i can't separate my life from being a bishop but i can separate what i do at work from my life you know, it's just like you can do that and keep it separate. But you can't do that as a bishop. So your life becomes your job. And she's, she's going to be involved one way or another, you know. So if she's not on board, you don't want it to become like a competition of your wife versus the ministry. She needs to understand that she's in this as well. And, you know, when you make a choice to do something, she gets in behind and supports that as opposed to just thinking, ah, oh, you're always neglecting us. You're always doing stuff for the church. You're always doing, like, you know, like Elizabeth, I don't know, she, I'm not saying she never has that prayer of mine. Like I said, I'm not perfect. But I'm saying, you know, we have an understanding that, you know, there'll be times where she knows I've got to dedicate some time to do something. And she, she doesn't get bitter again. She'll take, you know, she'll look after you. She'll get all the children ready because she knows I've got to focus on this one thing. I've, you know, I might need to go and visit somebody and talk to somebody and, you know, she doesn't get bitter that I have to take that time away or whatnot. So, and, and, and it's because we're of the same mind, right? It's because we see things the same way. We have the same goals. So there's an understanding there. That's what you need to be a successful bishop. Now, let's just go through these qualifications just quickly. I want to show you here, when you compare 1 Timothy 3 to Titus 2, the aged women, I don't know if you realize this, but they actually line up together. So in, in 1 Timothy 3.11, it says, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Now, we read in Titus 2, you, you'll notice here that it actually each of them line up with those four things that are mentioned. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. So to me, I see that as somebody being grave, right? They're serious about the faith, right? And that's why they're acting in a way where they're becoming more holy, right? More godly not false accusers so you can see here with the not slanderers so you're not a slanderer because you're not false accusing people you're not given to much wine right that lines up with being sober right clear-minded you're obviously not a drunkard and things like that teachers of good things and then it goes on to what those good things are that they may teach the young women to be sober to love their husbands to love their children to be discreet chaste keepers at home good obedient to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. So this is the faithful in all things, teachers of good things. And I would include, obviously, being a Christian and going soul winning, being involved in church and all those sorts of things. So just a couple of thoughts on each one of those four points. Now, when it comes to being grave, right, when I think of a, a, a bishop's wife being grave or a deacon's wife being grave, what I think about is that they're serious about Christianity. Right, they're serious about being a godly example. You know, they don't care what other people think. You know, some ladies, they just, they just care what other people think all the time. Think about how they dress. Think about how their hair is done. Think, like, you know, you don't, you don't I mean, and I, like I said, when, when it comes to these things, it's not that any of us are perfect. These are some things we have to keep in mind. So when we're great, we're like serious about Christianity. We're serious about being godly. It's not caring about what other people think, you know, and all this, just this vain stuff. 
You know, we're serious about the faith. We're, we're separated from the world. So if, if, I don't think a bishop's wife should be, you know, just, just vain, you know, vain, you know, about the way they look, you know, when it comes to, you know, they're, they're, they're proud or like they're materialistic. And there's the ones, obvious, obvious ones, where it's just, you know, women should not be dressed immodestly. You know, women should be dressed, they should be chaste and pure, you know, not just literally, right? And obviously they're an adulterer, but I'm saying like the way they look when it comes to wives. They, you know, some people, sometimes you'll see a bishop and his wife is just dressed so provocatively, just yeah. thinking like, how do you let your wife dress like that? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, to, like tell your wife to dress a bit more modestly. Or, it's just like, it's just amazing that people will, will, will let their wife dress like that. And they're meant to be an example to Christianity. So you don't want bishops and deacons' wives to be dressed like a teenager. You know, there's a time to put away childish things. And for women, it's just like having the fancy hair and all the jewelry and fancy clothes. Like, you know, that should not be the mark of a godly woman. A godly woman should be her works, right? When the Bible says in First Peter, it's, it's, it's that, that inner man, that meek and quiet spirit. It's not what they look like on the outside. And if people get that impression of a woman, you know, you're not a very spiritual woman if people, that's what they think about you. They, they think, hey, you're just all about how you look, you know. So, serious about the church of work. Uh, so, so serious about the work of church as well, right? So they realize the gravity of soul winning, the reason why we gather together, the importance of church. You know, where it's not just, you know, sometimes with, with, with men that have that mindset where they're just sort of dragging their women along for the ride, like their women, you can tell they're not really into church. You know, they're just there because they have to be there. And it's like, if that man wants to be a bishop, I'm not saying, and don't get me wrong, guys, I'm not saying this applies to any of your wives, right? Um, I'm just saying, like, you know, this is, this is what happens. And when people, they do that, they think they can just get into the ministry and their wife is not on board and all. They, that is a train wreck waiting to happen. Now, not only this, like, uh, so these are things that are one, obviously, your wives to consider, and you guys to consider too, you know, and everyone here to, to hear what I'm saying. It says here, not slanderers, not false accusers. Now, why is it important that the bishop's wife is not a slanderer or a false accuser, right? So what does that mean? They're not quick to speak or to comment. They can speak truthfully, but they speak in love. But you don't want them to be spreading sensitive information or false information, right? Because they, they're going to be married to somebody that has a lot of sensitive information, has a lot of personal information about people. It's very easy for them to get dirt on people if they wanted to be a slanderer, if they wanted to be a false accuser. And what you need to understand when you are a bishop's wife is you need to realize that even though you may not think of yourself, you're not the leader of the church, your husband is, you need to realize that because you're married to the leader of a church, you're married to people that are, people are looking to as an example. You can't get away from the fact that your words will have an impact. You know, people do look to, hey, what are bishops' wives' opinions? What do they think? You know, what's their take on the situation? Your words will have impact, and this is why you can't be a slanderer. You can't be a false accuser because your words have impact even though you're not the bishop. Now, obviously, sober, not given to much wine it isn't obvious. You know, you can't be a drunkard. That's the same for a bishop or a deacon. But what I think of sober as well is you need to be clear-headed. You know, you need to understand what's going on. Like we talked about being grave. Why? The reason why you need to be sober, because sometimes you may, as a woman, you may need to judge a situation. And you need to know what's going on. So when I think of soberness here, when it comes to being a bishop's wife, it's, it's that you're engaged with the issues that are going on in church. You know, like with, with some bishops, wives, they're like oblivious to what's going on. Yeah. You know, like you don't want your wife to be oblivious to what's happening. Like with this whole Trinity thing, you know, like you don't want, to be, you don't want them to be oblivious to this. Like they don't have an opinion on it. They don't really get there. Like, what's the whole big deal about this whole thing? It's like if you don't see what the big deal is, you, you, you're not clear headed. You're not getting what's going on here, like, and why it's a big deal. So sober, right? Clear headed, because sometimes they need to give advice. People are going to ask them, you know, so they need to seek to understand these issues. You know, because some women, they're, they're just not engaged. Some women are just not engaged in these things. You know, some, 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 sometimes we, like, I find in our church as well, you know, like the men are the ones that are more engaged, you know, knowing what's happening. They're interested. They want to they get, they want to nut things out. But women, it's the time they come, they're kind of like, well, they, they don't really mind. They don't really, you know, that's just the impression I get, you know. But you don't want to be a woman like that. You want to be engaged. You want to know what's going on. 
uh, you know, because uh, and, and, people are going to ask for your opinion. They're going to ask for your counsel. So you don't want to give ignorant counsel. And the last one, so grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Right? Faithful in all things. So you think about what this is talking about, you know, faithful as a faithful wife, a faithful uh, mother with your children, faithful in how you're discreet, you're chaste, you're a homekeeper, you're obedient to your own husband. So we, you shouldn't be seen as a woman that is constantly rebelling against her husband, right? So that, that's a reflection on the man as well, right? Not just for bishops. So that's, a, that's another qualification for a bishop's wife. Um, so you think about being obedient, meek and quiet, pure and chaste, you know, the home's in order, you're a good wife and a mother. Um, but I would also, when it comes to faithful in all things, like I said, like consistent with soul winning, you know, you help out at church, um, you know, consistent attendance at church, right? When it, like, I don't say it applies to anybody here, but sometimes with ladies, you guys ever, have you guys ever known a lady where it's just, it, she's just sick, she's just conveniently sick all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like whenever they don't want to do things, it's like, oh, you know, now they've got like stomach pains. Yeah. Now, it's like, and it's just like, it's, there's always a reason to like, not, and it's like, you know, you, you, can't, you can't be like a committed bishop and have a wife that's just always making excuses for, for, not, for not, not getting involved in things like that. So I'm not saying this applies to you guys. I'm just saying, I know, what, one thing I will say is, um, with, and, and with, with all of you guys, because I do think it applies to everybody here, is, is pregnancy, ladies, it's not a disability. <laughs> pregnancy is not a disability. It's not like you get pregnant and you can't go to church anymore. Yeah. You can't go soul winning. You can't help out. It, that's like, pre you know, that's why, like, like, my wife would sometimes come to me and just go, like, I don't get how, like, like, some ladies, they have one baby, now they just can't do anything. And it's like, she's got five kids. And she's like, so, and I don't think, like, my wife is just, like, something that you guys aren't, you know what I mean? I just think sometimes ladies have this idea in their head that once they're pregnant, they just can't do anything. And I just want to say, pregnancy is not a disability. You know, if you're pregnant, you can still do things. You can still pick up things and help and things like that. You know, um, obviously after you give birth or in the last trimester, you should be taking it easy. But like I said, just because you're pregnant doesn't mean you can't go soul winning. You can still go soul winning even when you're pregnant. You know, if you can walk to the shops, you can go soul winning, right? So I hope that gives you a few things to think about. Like I said, I'm not saying any of these things particularly because I think you guys are doing any of these things, but I just, I just feel like when it comes to the qualifications of a bishop, the wife is never emphasized. But what I want you guys to understand is the wife is very important when it comes to you guys doing something for the Lord and, and being committed to a ministry because you've got to realize she has to be in it as well. If she's not in it, you're, gonna, it's just, you're just adding more strife you know, to, to that relationship. And you don't want that when you start a work for God, you guys, bo you, you both need to be on board. You both need to understand the gravity of the task so that you can just, because the ministry is hard enough as it is already, guys, to not have strife between you and your wife, right? And strife in your family. Your family needs to be like this close knit team so that when you guys go and start something, it's just, there's, there's no question about the relationship. It's just, we are full steam ahead serving God. So a few things to just conclusion, you know, to be a bishop, obviously there's qualifications not only for the man, also for his wife. Your wife needs to be 100% on board to be successful. Remember, character, more important than doctrine, right? Not that doctrine is not important, but character is more important. And, and remember guys, please don't tune out because this, this applies to all of us. Even though you may not be a bishop or a bishop's wife one day, please take this on personally and say, hey, even though I'm not going to be a bishop's wife, I need to strive for this standard because these qualifications is what God wants for everybody. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, thank you for the reminder. I'm not perfect either, Lord, you know, and we're not expecting, you know, you're not, nobody can expect perfection, but Lord, just help us to understand the gravity of the task. Help us to be sober and clear-minded about what needs to be done. And I pray, Lord, that you know, that we would strive to have strong families in this church, strong marriages, because, Lord, ultimately, we'll have a strong church and a, and a church that's fervent in charity. We have families that are fervent in charity. So thank you, Lord, for reminding us tonight. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.